So hello, I'm Matthias. I'm an environment artist currently working for Remedy and interested in tech art and pipelines. And in this presentation, Game Art Insights Art Tech and Teamwork, I will share my learnings from using Blender in non-Blender game pipelines, like the learnings and struggles and how to overcome them. So the last projects I worked on are Alan Wake 2 plus the two extensions, the Night Springs episodes and the Lake House. But I want to start with the backstory, how I ended up using Blender in production. So I started in a mid-sized German company called King Art Games. We did a horror adventure and I tried to learn Maya. I did the first blockouts and modeling in Maya um, because that's the pipeline they use. But then I was given this bigger task. I should create a bigger modular kit uh, for one of the main locations. And I didn't know how I could achieve that in time with, with Maya. I felt more comfortable with Blender. So I convinced the team, hey, please let me try it in Blender. And if it doesn't work, I, I will go back and, and switch. And now, a few years later, I've been using my um, Blender in non-Blender pipelines ever since. So from uh, this mid-sized game project to freelance work, to uh, industrial visualization, to now in AAA productions like Crossfire and Alan Wake. Um, I also started to create some tools on the site that just make it easier for me to create game art, uh, but that's more a side project. And let's start with the basic. What does it mean to make art for games? Um, the main difference to most of the things we've seen here today is that nothing we do is, the end use is never inside of Blender, but we always go through a chain of conversions. We always go through a chain of tools and to a game engine. So what we create is intended to be used somewhere else. And I think that's a really essential difference to, to most of the, to the animation talks we saw today. And I would define a pipeline. A pipeline is a structured process standardizing tasks. It supports collaboration and increases productivity by reducing complexity automating repetitive steps and ensuring consistency. And these two points bring me together why it can be challenging to use Blender in, in a game pipeline, because uh, before we saw a pipeline is standardizing processes. So it doesn't mean that you need to have a, a tool and a button that says export, but at least all the steps are known you need to take to get from A to B from the software, the main DCC uh, for context DCC is a digital content creation software. So I use it for Blender, Maya, Substance, whatever you use to create. Um, but in a company pipeline, these steps are defined. And when you are not using the company pipeline, you need to figure it out yourself. This means you are forced to uh, tackle a lot of technical questions and you need to dig into this this technical area and that's what makes it uh, difficult and I divide my part in my presentation in three parts one thing is collaboration you usually work we work together on big games and so it's important that that's we are aware of that the second one is interoperability. How can I transfer my data from uh, between the software? And the last point is achieving high quality. And in the context of games, it doesn't necessarily only mean it needs to look good, but it needs to be a system, consistent quality and consistent technical requirements. So I want to start with a practical example for the collaboration. We have an asset, these trees from a personal project, for example. And when we work in a team, we need, need to make sure that everyone has access to our uh, file. That's pretty straightforward. The pipeline will have some uh, tools in place to do version control and making sure that we can share our data. It can be Perforce, GitHub, 
or whatever else other system ha we they have in place. The only difference is that um, we might, if we are using Blender, um, the company DCC might have uh, tools in place to immediately check out things and submit things, and we need to do that through the other tools. But that's pretty easy. The second part is we need to make sure that whatever we do is usable by others. Here it's just a very simple example that we set proper pivots that others can just drag it into and it works easily. You can prop immediately. So we need to be aware whatever we do should be easy to use. Um, and the more, the most difficult of this pipeline fundamentals is how can we make sure that others can do edits and this is the really challenging part and here I want to zoom out further taking a further a, a bigger look at um, some specific aspects of a game pipeline so one important thing is we usually distinguish, distinguish between work data and source data so work data is the software where we create it. It's the artist. We work on our asset. We make it cool. And then we have this, um, then we get it out of the software into this intermediate format. Here it's FBX. And we re get rid of all the data we don't need and uh, have this really hard to edit data. But for example, a level designer or lighting artist working in engine they need the source data to basically build the game they will they should never have to interact with the work data with the blender file but they need the source data to build the game and they are usually also handled in different um, directories so that's one important thing and here is just a graph again of how the data goes through the pipeline so we work in, in whatever software we are working in, then we go to an intermediate format, and then we go to the engine where it's usually converted again, like they don't use FBX natively, but they do usually further conversions. And this brings me back, we can go zoom in, uh, how can we handle this work data problem or work data in general? And I experienced three different ways of dealing with it. The first one is just providing the source data. Um, the second one is you having the work data in Blender. And the third one is that we transfer the work data to the main DCC. And the first option, providing only source data, basically ignores the problem. And we only share what is then used in the game engine. And others can do barely do any edits and changes to it. This is, I did this, for example, when I did freelance work and then they would request changes and I would do them and then provide again the source data. The second option is that we have the Blender file, we share the Blender file and pretty clear we provide the Blender file where you can export it and we provide the data that is used to create the game. And then the third thing is if we work in a bigger pipeline, they might have their, their own pipeline exporter. And so, so we kind of are forced to, to go through the mine, main pipeline. And here I have to experience two options. And um, one is basically going through the mine, main pipeline. So we export the trees, we import them to Maya. And then we use the company pipeline that I said before the pipeline means the steps are already in place. So we need to figure out this first step, how we can do that efficiently, but then we follow the company pipeline. Um, I found this quite difficult to do fast iterations. Um, so I tried to do this um, to basically use them in parallel. So this means you can, you try to imitate the pipeline and so you can export from Blender, do your quick iterations and then at some point point in the process you update like for a, before the end of a milestone before you ship something or like certain timelines then you make sure you transfer everything to the main pipeline so that you others can do edits for whatever use and if you get sick or parental leave or whatever 
um, later in the process, game projects are very long, so somebody might need to touch it a year later. So it's they might. It's important that there is some way of editing the, the files. Um, if we share the uh, Blender file, I have a few guidelines. Um, I think it's very helpful to have a structured uh, file, like having some standardized structure. It doesn't need to be very rigid, but it should be clear. Blender can be very confusing with different scenes and the collection, especially for somebody who is not really familiar with it. Um, having them, the files mostly self-contained is makes life much easier because you can simply share the one file and don't need to share all the linked assets and resources. Uh, there was a lot of issues, I think, in the pipeline talks before, how you handle links and so on. So I would just try to avoid that completely. And then the other thing is I would make it very clear what is intended to go out. Like you have all these helper object, Boolean objects, and so that are not needed for somebody who just wants to export it. Make it very clear what you want to export. And here is just an example from this project. We have here the assembled tree assets. And here is the low poly that we can export for baking. We have then the high poly, also intended for baking. Um, we have elements that are used to assemble the different trees. Then again, we have the assembled trees, so I use the same elements to assemble different assets. And then we have the export, like it's pretty clear, I think, it says export their collection, each collection is an asset, so it's pretty easy to communicate. This is the thing that goes to the engine. Um, this is just a really useful tip. I don't know if how many knows, but know that, but you can assign different shapes to uh, empties and change the sizes. So I basically use a huge cube empty for this is important. And this is a good way to, to further structure your, your scene. I also want to uh, sh show a practical um, a practical example of this guidelines for uh, by comparing the old standard exporter with the new collection exporter. Le it was very hard to communicate with the old export how what to export because you need to communicate to somebody what they need to select. Like you need to recreate the selection and you need to communicate all the settings you, you figured out um, to export. Um, Basically, how do you share that information? It's not contained in the file. There is a lot of, of um, in, yeah, a lot of things you need to communicate. Uh, while with the collection export, you have the collection and automatically everything below the collection gets exported, um, which makes this obsolete the problem of what to export. And then we just need to uh, press the export all because the settings of what to export is contained in the file. I can send this file to somebody and he presses the one button and it uses the same settings. And I think this is a really good example of how what makes it easier to share files and having these self-contained files. And I would also, I heard it in talk before, like these add-ons that change data. Um, add-ons are great to create it, but they shouldn't be necessary because if they are necessary, you always need to share the, the add-on as well and make the infrastructure to share them. So keeping it as simple as possible um, is really helpful. And then you can layer add-ons and so on top, like I'm currently working on a, a tool to just improve the workflow of exporting different collections. It's giving me an overview of all the collections that have an exporter. I have a function to replace. I mentioned that work data and source data might be stored in different locations. So I can set the source data path based on where I've saved the work file, the Blender file. And it shows me if the file is locked by Fairforce, for example, but it doesn't you don't need it to export if I send it to somebody else. It just makes my life easier. 
Um, this brings me to the second part is um, interoperability, like how can we make it easier to get the data out and into another software and reduce the problems there. And here I have also a personal project, this cotton spinning mule as an example. This is probably the most complex single asset I ever created. It has a lot of different uh, instances and different parts. And uh, the main goal was to create a modeling, uh, to model it. And I achieved that. I, it, I'm pretty happy with that. But then it was about to texture it and get it into the game engine. And I felt like, oh, this again, the same size project. I'm, I'm, I don't feel like doing that. But I, for this presentation, I felt that I revisited with all the new learnings. Can I get it to the game engine? And we will see. <laughs> so one very helpful thing is, I think we to distance yourself when you do this kind of thing from art and just see it as pure data, what you're dealing with at this point, because we need to get it from A to B and want to conserve all the information. And like in a high level, we have a hierarchy of objects and they have names and transformations. So that's the very high level. And then the objects have data in them. And I, I everything with its mesh data, vertices, edges, and faces, because everything like curves. And so we usually convert to mesh data uh, for the game engine. And then we have normals that have one side that is rendered and the other side that is not rendered. And then vertex normals where it gets tricky um, to transfer that data. That data. Um, here I have an example with completely broken normals. Then I enabled the sharp edges. It looks already better. And then I enabled the weighted normals. And now it's nicely shaded without any normal maps. And we need to make sure that we transfer all of this data uh, to the engine. But then it gets even more tricky. And I don't want to go too much into detail here. But when you apply normal maps, um, vertex normals have a form a coordinate system together with tensions and by tensions that define how the normal map is interpreted and the shading. So if you get into problems there, it's become much easier. Most of the software uses now MIGT dungeon space, so you need to worry about that too much. But one thing that is still um, different in different software is if they use left-handed or right-handed coordinate system. Not important, not so important what it really is, but you need to flip the green channel in the normal map. That's the reason um, that the dungeon space that is flipped. Um, so there's different software. They have either Y up or Y minus. Um, in substance, it's called open GL or DirectX. Um, that's basically the same thing. And it also relates to this dungeon space. And if you can't figure, if you have issues with normal maps and nothing makes sense, then you have to dig into this. And it's not fun, but I'm sorry. <laughs> so another thing we, we deal with in game art is EV coordinates. It's basically how to map 2D textures to our 3D meshes. And we also have different, we can have multiple of these coordinate systems per object. So basically here we have a lot of overlapping because each material has its uh, UV coordinates. And then I have a, I will go back. I, I have a second UV that maps the entire object. Basically I could use that for a light map or for a mask if I decide in a shader I want to map something on the entire object. And here, when I select only one object, we see now I have the UV map for these parts and they are not overlapping. They are nicely laid out. And here we have materials for our object. Uh, we can uh, display in the different color, which makes it easy. We can view them in the different colors. Uh, it's really handy when you try to figure out how many materials you want and need. And then when we go to the engine, sometimes we need additional data depending on the engine and like custom LODs, level of detailed meshes, physics, 
meshes. Um, here I have an example of simplified couches uh, that uh, interact with these falling cubes or just location points where you can attach objects. So, okay, we, we briefly looked at what, what data we are dealing with and now let's look at the asset. And yeah, like I already mentioned, we need to make sure that all of this data is transferred from our Blender file to the game engine and there is multiple potential breaking points. So one first step is, uh, is the problem import or export? So one easy step to find that out is importing it into Blender because then you, if you have a problem there, you know it's not the import to the game engine. Um, and we see it's a complete mess, this asset. It, the shading looks all right, but the hierarchy is something. So I want to start with that. And uh, I just think dealing with so many components, it, it, it's basically impossible to figure out the problems and analyzing all these data points. So we want to simplify whatever we export as much as possible. And here I worked a lot with collection instances and so, and so I want to realize all the instances, convert all not meshes to meshes, apply all the modifiers, except probably the weighted uh, normal modifier, apply the transformation, see if I had a negative transformation or something, and then probably merge them together. And now we have less data that we need to analyze. And when I apply the transformation, I see now I suddenly have inverted um, normals on some of the parts. That's because I had a negative scale because that was an easier way to do it. But now I have a problem because of that. So I fix that. Uh, after merging them together, I see there is a shit ton of materials that are not supposed to be there. So I need to go into the elements and get rid of all the materials that are not supposed to be there. And the UV maps have different names. That can sometimes happen that the add-on uses a UV, map, a UV name or I named something different. And yeah, so I need to clean up the UV sets and make them a singular name so that the engine reads it properly. And we only see that when we merge the objects together because Blender is smart and has one active UV set and it will just take the active UV set for the object. So we need to merge it to see this problem. And then there is a whole debate on how clean topology should look and how clean UVs should look. I don't want to go into that too much. We will touch it briefly in the, the last part, how to achieve a high production quality but there is much more online, um, how to, what to look for and how to achieve that. So, okay, we did our cleanup bus in Blender. So now we can revisit it in, in engine. And the first issues you usually encounter are transformations and the Blender export has different options. Um, it's always an experiment or looking online what others use and sometimes you can figure it out. What's also really helpful, for example, with Unreal, it has the import transformation so you can counterbalance whatever doesn't work. So I had few issues with um, Unreal and then with Unity, for example, it imports correctly. I have this reference cube one by one by one meter and my asset is imported correctly, but I have this hundred scale transformation, which I don't want. And I'm sure there is uh, smarter ways, but my fallback if I can't figure it out is basically having a empty object and counter the transformations. It's something I started, I learned many years ago and it's still working and it's like my last resort if I can't figure out the transformation. This has worked so far. So, um, yeah. It's also using an empty is a good idea in general because you can use it to define the pivot point of your asset. Um, so it's handy in that as well. 
And now that I use this counter transformation, I have the proper transformations in Unity. Um, okay, so we see I managed to import Desert in Unreal. We have textures. I didn't have a lot of time to spend on the textures here, uh, but it's technically working. Um, so now I mentioned that the workflow that sometimes you might want to go or need to go through the company DCC. So we face the same problems again, but first I want to share a tip uh, when you have to do that. One good tip is um, creating a very simple asset in the DCC, export it through the company pipeline and then import it to Blender and then you kind of see the data you try to imitate because then you, 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 yeah, you reverse engineer what you got from the company um, pipeline. So we want now to get it to the company DCC. In my case, it was always Maya. So you have, again, the same issues as with the uh, game engine. You have the transformation issues, but additionally, you have these issues of difference hierarchy, difference in software, like a Maya group has, is not the same as a Blender collection and you can't reproduce that one-to-one. -one. So basically you need to communicate with the company tech team that I can't provide a Maya group when I import it, but it will be a locator with the, the files below it. I don't really know what's the difference there in Maya. I haven't seen major difference. And so far that was okay in every case. And then the just different software has different restrictions, for example, on naming. And we will see that, no, wrong button. We will see that here. So uh, special characters in names is not good for Maya. And you can't have a material with the same name as the object. So you can't have cube with the material cube. That will also change the material name. So that's just things you need to be aware. So you would need to name the object cube and the, the material cube material. And that's one uh, question or proposal to the Blender team. Please uh, avoid adding special characters automatically. Like it's cool that you're allowed to use them, but it's less cool if they are added automatically because it makes interoperability a bit more difficult. And I started lately using a new um, process to automate the simplification process and opened up a lot of new opportunities on how, how I export and uh, assemble objects. And that's very simple, but very powerful. So I call it the asset merge uh, group uh, geometry modifier, but it's very simple. So basically, uh, it doesn't matter what geometry we have here, but I can, I stored the um, modifier in the asset library and I can instance a um, um, collection. And this basically takes, does the whole uh, simplification process we saw before. One second. So, and here we see the node setup. It's very simple. It's basically just taking the collection info and then realizing it and outputting it. And then you can add additional uh, operations on top, but this is the basic node setup. There is a few issues with this. Um, I noticed I need to, instances themselves don't export, so I need to realize them. But realizing instances breaks the weighted normals. I assume this is a bug, so I need to, you need to apply the um, weight normal modifier on top again and the visibility of the data is not really great. 
uh, we will see that later and it can have a performance impact if you use that in a big scene so you might I disable the export uh, collection if I don't use it because otherwise just everything gets a bit slower in this particular case which merges thousands of objects I don't for smaller objects it's not a problem but for big complex objects so here we have it sh the shading is correct but as soon as I realize it it destroys the normal so I need to reapply on top of this setup the uh, weighted normal modifier and here I show that the visibility of data that is a problem so everything is applied correctly we have the materials and the UVs as we can see in the viewport but it doesn't show in the properties so basically we need to apply the modifier that we can analyze if the materials and uh, um, UVs are correct and also in, in geometry notes itself I didn't see properly the data so it's it's very simple you apply you duplicate the object you apply and you analyze it but for export I don't even apply it I just export the, the, the modifier and then is how to work in blender is how can we achieve great quality inside of blender like before we go all this process of exporting it and integrating it into our pipeline so one important thing is how can we manage complexity and this is very basic you usually start with uh, simple shapes and figure out uh, sizes of things and then I separate repeating elements and make reuse them and this brings me to instancing I think most of you are familiar with object instancing so basically you duplicate an object but it has the same object data assigned to it but what I use very heavily is collection instancing so basically this is an instance of the entire op uh, collection and what's cool is you can basically split it apart in different elements and be very flexible whatever you do inside of it and it also has the uh, transformation and location which is very hidden so I think not many people know it but you can assign uh, basically a position to the collection so this allows you to have uh, like this object is made of mostly of individual collection instance so I take one piece and then I split it always in smaller part and you can nest them and then no I didn't show all of it um, because later in the video I go to the basically the collection library the element library should come soon yeah here you see all the individual all elements that are then used to assemble the asset and here is a few things I did to make it easier for myself um, basically I have a operator just to assign it to the select uh, the location of uh, the instance offset to the current object and I also added recently uh, here's the problem if I move in my, something in my library it moves in the, the assembled scene and I think this would be really cool to come with Blender that you can specify an object I did it quickly with Python it's quite easy to add but I think this would be great addition to this work um, I want to further uh, show how I use this asset merge uh, group that I showed before I used it to simplify the entire object but I lately experimented that I can use it basically to design the hierarchy of the object that I use so this is just every object uh, if I realize them so it's thousands of objects it's a mess but here I split it into logical parts and it doesn't need to be basically I, I categorize the different things in different collections and then I uh, 
instead of instancing, uh, realizing the entire object, I instance different uh, collection parts and I can basically split it however I want. So here, by using the same input meshes, I have different variations of the same mesh. One time I have the entire object as one object and here I split it into the moving cart and here I have a variation with the moving cart outside. So basically you can create hierarchies and you can create variations of your model. And I could create easily a variation of just the middle part or some gear that I then export to the game engine. And what's also very cool about this approach is usually uh, doing changes that late when you combined everything and so it's very tedious. But I decide, oh, they look too straight. I want to add some randomization. So I do it in the collection where I do want to do it. And it propagates to all these variations that I sent to the game engine. And this is, um, yeah, this just automates this entire baking down, reducing complexity before getting it out to another software. Um, just briefly, um, again, managing complexity. I think most of you do is with, it's trying to keep it as simple as possible, the mesh itself, and then you layer complexity on top of it. And for game art, usually there is this one, at some point there is the destructive step where you then apply the modifiers, you get clean up the topology and you create the UV maps and here you also see a lot of the issues. Um, and I think here is also an area that could use some improvements like finding end guns. There is add-ons for it, but the built-in workflow is basically select faces by sides greater than four. It's a bit of counterintuitive workflow for finding um, end guns. And I think it could be improved a lot by having better viewport um, tools like overlays that show you problematic areas and just making this a bit more straightforward. And just a, one more quick tip to check the normal issues for high polys and low polys and so is to use the mat caps because you can really figure out um, if something is broken like use something very shiny and or also the normal and you will see if how well the normals work and that was a lot of theory and uh, probably a bit heavier so at times so let's look at some production examples to wrap it up um, this is uh, stage crates I made for Alan Wake 2, the hard surface team, so they do mostly of the modeling. I ju just jumped in for this asset because they had a limited uh, resource at the time. So basically this was before I had the entire workflow in place. Um, basically I would create the white box, the rough shape, and then uh, export it to the engine, test if it works, replace it in the level, and then uh, splitting it up again into its components and they are reused. And here I can have the high polys and then I can replace the individual parts with the low poly um, components, basically uh, the collection instances. And with the asset merge node, I can basically export it now at any point. I could basically export the high poly to the game engine. I could export the white box from white box to high poly to whatever in between state to low poly. I can export it at any time. And I added for myself, for example, that I can override the material because the high poly might have ID materials that I don't want. So I just override the material with a white box material and I can export it at any state. And this is the first time I really used this new workflow uh, in production was for the expansion extension, the lake house extension. So here we see these are the 
first white boxes that I used in level just to test out the scale and if they work for what we want to achieve. Uh, now I skip the video again. And it's again the same as we saw with the trees. Basically, I have the low polys, I have the high polys, I have mid polys that don't use normal map, um, baked normal maps, and then I assemble. I have elements, I assemble them, and then I have the export collection where I use the asset merge to combine them. And the collections have the collection export that I can export, and I can hand over this file to somebody, and they, it's clear what they need to export, and it's a very clear structure. And it's still, I can do changes to the drawer, and it will propagate to everything, and I don't need to merge everything together again. Um, so, and here, just for completion, I also updated the Maya file to have it all in there. Um, yes, and this is a small sneak peek. where the shelves were used. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's basically the end of my talk. And yeah, questions. Hi. Uh, wait. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the tools that you created are they available somewhere? Like the simple exporter and. Uh, um, not yet. The sim I have simple collision. Uh, it's still called Collider Tools. I'm rebranding it at the moment. And the simple renaming tool is on extension platform. Okay. Thanks. Hello. There we go. <laughs> it was on the first time. Anyway, uh, working in a AAA studio, uh, what are your like your colleagues' feelings towards Blender generally? Switching to Blender, going from Maya. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not there to to tell them to switch it's their decision you should work with whatever you feel most comfortable like I'm happy that they allow me to use what I feel comfortable so I feel I should do the same um, yeah just support the artists as well as possible thank you Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, uh, it's very in insightful. Uh, when you realize the instance uh, and you export as a single mesh, in the end you recreate the, the instance in the engine or do you keep as a single mesh? The, in engine it's a single mesh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quick question, your UV maps look very, very clean and organized. <laughs> Which add-on are you using? <laughs> UV Packmaster. <laughs> Makes sense, okay. Hello, uh, so you showed us that you are exporting an FBX format, but uh, what about other formats like USDs, which meant to be universal if uh, you are utilizing it or not? Um, so USD is used by the new 
engine for a lot of things, but I, we're not there yet. And I don't know the exact plans. I think that's it.